So I'm very happy to welcome uh, Jake Long back to Miami's campus. <clears throat> Thanks, Daryl. So, as he said, I've been here before, and uh, I've actually attended some of these conferences, and it's really fun to be able to come back and present. It's a real honor. And um, so, what I'm going to talk to you about today is my thesis work, and follow that up with a little bit of my interest that will most likely continue long after I'm done uh, as a official academic, but you won't ever be able to get rid of me, so hope, <laughs> hope you like me. I'm here. Um, so to get started, uh, I was really inspired to look into Miami Corn after reading uh, Dr. Mike Ganella's dissertation that he did here at uh, Miami University. So from there, I was uh, working at the Miami Tribe at, in the cultural office for a little while and then moved to Oklahoma State University to work on my master's. So, let's see if I can get this pulled up. <coughs> All right. So, the title of my talk is Miamia Minjipe, Genetic Relationships and Preservation. And I'm really focusing on the genetic relationships for my thesis and my interests uh, flow from there into the preservation of Miami corn since it's such an integral part of our culture and language and history. So I just would like to catch you up on some of the basics of Native American corn or maize is a more specific term and it was domesticated in around 9,000 years ago in southern Mexico and from there it spread north all the way up to Canada in the north, the southeastern part of Canada and all the way south into Argentina and Chile. And you can see in the picture here on the bottom is just a very small sample of the diversity that uh, is present in corn today and was most likely much more diverse in the past. So as corn became more diverse um, and began to move north into central Mexico, there are a lot of different what are called races that were established. And those races were categorized by color um, and texture of the endosperm, which is the, uh, what makes up most of the volume of a kernel of corn. And from those kind of broad categories, it was even more diverse in to what are called land races. And I have the definition up there, but basically a land race is a specific population of corn that was developed by a people group. And Miami had several land races. Um, however, only one was really preserved well to the best of my knowledge and what I've been able to find. So the bottom here you can see an image of a piece of Miami corn and it's unique in its shape to what you are used to seeing in field corn or sweet corn. It's very long and narrow um, and the, the kernels are much larger than your average kernel of corn and they're very good for making a flour or hominy. Um, all right, so <laughs> that was not my phone. <laughs> so Miami white corn or Miami white flower corn in specific is what I became most interested in and it was preserved by Miami families in Indiana. And there are some potential other um, locations or in different organizations where it was preserved, but the exact history of where all of the Miami corn that I am aware of today came from. But it's likely that some of it, or maybe all of it, came from one or two ears that were uh, held by a tribal member who began to share them 
And since that point, they've been distributed and grown um, by Miami families throughout the Miami community. And that is one of the reasons I've been inspired to look into some of the genetics of Miami corn. It's very culturally significant, as you saw David Costa mentioned in many of the different documents that he's been looking at. They have lots of terms for Miami corn and how uh, it was used. <coughs> And there's also a lot of his, uh, stories, traditional stories that use Miami corn. And there's even some origin stories in the Miami language and many other tribes have similar stories for their origins for, for their sources of corn. So, I already skipped to some of that. The, uh, there wasn't really any evidence from what I could find of Miami corn being grown widely between the 1940s and the 1990s. Um, I don't know all of the Miami people who've been growing corn, but from the people I've talked to, we couldn't really find anybody in that date that had been growing. And it was widely thought that it had been lost until the one family that is known to have saved it began sharing it with other Miami families. So if that is the case, there's a potential for a genetic bottleneck, which basically means the genetic diversity that's within the population. So just like the population of Miami people that we have here today, there's differences in each person. There's, it's similar in corn. So if you go through a, a genetic bottleneck where you go to just one or two ears, that diversity is reduced. And that can have effects on its ability to um, produce in the future which we haven't seen so far um, in any serious ways, but it's something to be concerned about or to take note of. And that fancy word there, integration, just means that there's possible for cross-pollination into Miami corn from other types of corn, especially modern day ones. So that is something that the family members who have been saving Miami corn and preserving it um, are very familiar with when you see new traits that start to move in. You have to save seed corn that is uh, most similar to the way it has been. So for my thesis, I have a, a hypothesis for what I'm hoping to find. And it's that the patterns of genetic diversification of white flower land races will align with a pattern of dispersal from northwest Mexico to southeast Canada. And I will show you a map and kind of point that out so it makes a little more sense in just a second. But the implications of that is that we will be able to see the, the past gene flow or the trade of this race of white flower corn. And as it was traded, it became more diverse into these separate land races as it was moving from the southern part of the United States up to the northeast corner of the United States. So it will also help us with some of the details of tribal relationships and to look at, see maybe if we can find instances where there could be tr contact between tribes that haven't been documented so far. So one of the things that took me a while to, under, to really understand, and I'm not sure this scientific community that's looked at maize uh, domestication and diversification has understood until recently, is the difference between the broad diversity of, of maize races and land races, and that that would most likely stem from the land races coming from a specific race. So similar land races would come from uh, one specific race of corn. So the, the reasons that I have done that is one for the genetic reasons, um, the other for more practical. It's present from Mexico to Canada, and it's actually very, it's much easier to identify in records than some of the other major races of corn. A large kernel with flowery type endosperm is pretty easy to pick out and something people usually note frequently. So 
that's part of it. Also, its development occurred for, further south in, into Mexico, and it persisted all the way up into the United States and into Canada. S many other races and land races either developed in Mexico or further north in the northern United States, but weren't uh, dispersed equally across the geography of the area I wanted to look at. So white flower corn really uh, has a broad dispersal and represents many different tribes. So, and another thing is kind of the staple of staples. If you look at the uses for the types of corn in Native American communities, they have popcorns and dent corns and sweet corns and they all are very important to the culture and survival of the people, but the white flower corns were kind of the the base that a lot of the other corn agriculture was grown off of. So that is the reasons why I chose white flower corn. And it's really nice because the only Miami corn we have is a white flower corn. So here's a picture of the tribes, the tribes from the United States pre-Columbus. And the sampling, the sampling I've done starts down here in the southwest United States, and some of those tribes are actually also from um, northwestern Mexico. And they have white flower corns where the ears and kernels look very similar to some of the white flower corns all the way up here in the northeast. So I also, it took me a long time to find, to collect them all together, but there's a uh, a scattered distribution of different land races that are from this area here. And I'm guessing that the northern Great Plains probably didn't have a lot of corn production. The, the culture of the tribes from that area were, were much different and more, a little more uh, nomadic or seasonal in their, um, where they lived. So that's the, the distribution and the dispersal of corn from its domestication point is below this table down here, you probably won't be able to see, but down in so south central Mexico. And it, not only did it disperse up to the southwest United States and then up, but there's also theories that um, some of the maize land races, <coughs> most likely not the white flower corns, actually skipped across the Caribbean into the southeast United States and then dispersed from there. So. This is one of the modes of uh, dispersal that I will be trying to see if my results tie into. And this is one of the trade networks that's very common, um, commonly referred to in some of the anthropological history of tribes and how certain objects ended up places where they wouldn't have expected to be seen ever just by, by the sheer distance. So, this is the Hopewell Interaction Sphere or Exchange Network, and it's just one of the, the larger trade networks that uh, was present uh, before Europeans arrived. And there were many different um, trade networks, and they kind of came and went over time. So uh, it'll be really interesting to see how, how my data lines up with that. If you notice, I'm making some predictions. I'm not quite done with my research yet. Um, but I did promise to some of you at the stomp dance um, that I would show you some data, and I have some data to show you. Um, but I don't have my final results yet. So this crazy thing that you're looking at here is what all of the pre-Columbian maze diversity looks like when you try to show the relationships between them all. And this was a really awesome study that was done by a guy named Vigaru, and he, there was some incredible sample, sampling that they did all over the Western Hemisphere. The part that I was most interested in is the, the purple area at about 2 o'clock. And that area wasn't as heavily sampled as some of the other areas. They did have uh, some Native American land races, but they didn't have a lot of them. And um, only had about seven um, white flower land races, and I hope to use at least twice that so I can have a better coverage of the, the entire 
United States, basically. So, let's see. All right, so this is going to be more like what my results will look like. I won't put them in that fancy circle. But this was a study that was done quite a while ago in 1999. And they used some more, um, some older technology for their, their analysis. And they included kind of a shotgun uh, sampling of different tribal land races. And one thing that I'll point out is you have two white land races here, and I believe this Winnebago land race is also a white land race. The rest of them are a pretty, pretty broad sample of all of the different types of land races you might find. So the relationships that you're seeing there are more likely gonna be what you'd see between the actual races and not the subheading of land races. So you probably find groups of the different races in here. But looking at the dispersal of corn would probably not be, that's, you wouldn't get any significant results because the different races were traded differently. So I promised some data and you guys will see a little bit more of a spreadsheet. You already saw a spreadsheet earlier today. But what you're looking at here, besides just a bunch of random numbers and letters, is some of the, the raw data that I have. And on the far left, you have the different colored bands are different land races of a white flower corn. And I actually don't remember what any of those numbers are. I have it saved somewhere in my computer. Um, but what I'm actually doing to, to find the relationship between each of these land races is I'm looking for a trail of breadcrumbs, essentially, that will show me where there are similarities and where there are differences. So this gray box on the right that includes these three columns is one trail of breadcrumbs. And it's called a molecular marker. And it's just differences in the uh, coding of DNA that you can look at and see which parts of the coding are similar, which parts are different. So if you imagine the gray box, all of those numbers on the far right in your genotype, those are the individual breadcrumbs. Sorry, walking away from Mike. So the individual breadcrumbs are here. And this is just length of a piece of DNA that I am looking at in particular. So this one has a length of 174 base pairs. And it has two copies, just like humans. Corn has a copy from mom and a copy from dad. So two copies, they're the same. Well, this land race here also has two copies of the same. So we'd infer that those are more related than, say, this one and this one, since it has one copy of the same and one copy that's different. So if you take that trail of breadcrumbs in those relationships, and then you take 30 other trails of breadcrumbs and put those together, you'll really be able to get a good idea of the relationships between all of the different land races. And if it was only that easy to analyze, I would be happy. But <laughs> that's, the, that's the gist of it. So my future work, once I have some real results from that, I'll interpret it to um, to look at the, the relationships between those land races and infer different cultural and trade um, theories or assumptions. And then I would like to move on to more of the population genetics of Miami white corn in specific. And this was a little bit of a budgetary problem with, and a time problem with my thesis. But I've, I've found some people that are willing to help me out on both ends. And um, it will be something I'll, I'll work on in the future. And I'll be looking for the effects of that bottleneck with in, uh, inbreeding and integration and look at some of the statistics that look at the variation that's left in the genetic diversity of different populations of Miami corn. Also, um, I've been uh, talking with some people at OSU, the OSU in Oklahoma, and uh, 
I'm, all, I'm going to have my corn tested for its nutritional uh, makeup, which is really exciting to a lot of us because we know a little bit about the nutritional information, but we haven't had it analyzed in a lab. So we'll get a label just like every other food label that says protein content, starch, fat, calories from fat, all that sort of thing. And we'll get that information pretty easily. And then a more um, long-term goal, and it's more of a community effort, would be to build a seed bank. And the community, the Miami community as a whole has done really well at preserving Miami corn. And I don't plan on changing that. I would just like to help and maybe provide a little more structure, um, especially if I can find different patterns in the the population genetics if um, it would help to maybe encourage different families to trade seed to uh, promote some more diversity in their in their populations that they're growing so that's what I will probably continue with either on the side or officially for a long time and with that I'd like to acknowledge uh, Chief Gamble and the rest of the business committee for their support and uh, not giving me a hard time when I left working for the, <laughs> the cultural office and supporting my, my endeavors at Oklahoma State. Um, the culture resources office has been just immensely helpful with any sort of thing I need and especially contacts and looking for people to get information from. Uh, the Meow Meow project has been helpful. Daryl and the whole team are just a great, uh, a great group to work with. Oklahoma State University, um, Dr. Mike Gannell for his thesis, or his dissertation that he wrote, which was just kind of the, the seed that germinated into this whole project, and then my advisor, Andrew Deft. And I'm gonna skip the questions because Julie Olds wanted me to show you this picture. So this is some of my, I did a pilot test to make sure there was enough genetic diversity in some of those breadcrumb trails that I was looking for. Uh, to make sure the project was feasible. So what you see around this kind of spiral is different types of corn that are either um, Native American land races or modern types of corn. And what you'll see here is this is Miami corn and that's essentially where it falls into the relationship between a lot of the modern day corn doesn't give me a lot of information as far as the trade history or anything like that because these are all modern hybrids and varieties, but it's really interesting. And these right here are some other Native American land races. And one of the basic ways you can read uh, a dendrogram like this is you look at where these lines join and where they're joined, that's the, the individuals that are most closely related. So you can see that these individuals are all very closely related. If you look down here, they're also fairly closely related to Miami white corn. There's also a Miami white corn right here, I believe. And uh, the other ones that you see here are actually hybrids that are grown in, commonly in Ohio, in Indiana, and in Kentucky. So there, that, there's no real statistical significance in those being there but it could uh, explain a little bit of maybe some cross-pollination. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks. Sure. Uh, you know, to, to build a seed bank that you're talking about to and, and get away from the uh, inbreeding and cross-pollination, how would you suggest that you accomplish that? Would you just go to areas, because you know, typically the Midwest is known for growing commercial corn, so that would be cross-pollination. So how would you suggest that you get into a, a, a pure state? Yeah, yeah, so that's a great question. And as far as establishing a seed bank, we wouldn't necessarily need one specific location, which that obviously wouldn't hurt but it's more it would be a coordination with the families that are growing it already because they're the ones who have already been preserving it but one of the the things that would be helpful is maybe a little bit of education on 
and a lot of the, the families already know this, but as far as timing of when you plant your corn, if you plant it earlier or later um, than the normal corn that's, that's growing out in the fields nearby, you can avoid the pollen cross-pollination because they will release their pollen after a certain number of days. And Miami corn differs from others, so you have to know who in your neighborhood or who in your you know, quarter section is growing um, corn, what type of corn they're growing, and how long it will be till it releases pollen. That way you can time when you grow Miami corn. That's probably the biggest, um, biggest way to avoid cross-pollination. For the, for the inbreeding or, for the inbreeding problem, I don't think as a whole Miami corn is too inbred to survive and I really, I really would be surprised if, if I had any results that showed inbreeding. Um, normally that's a problem with hybrids because they're very, they're basically you take one genetically identical parent and another uh, parent and you cross them and you get some diversity between the two. But your whole field of corn is basically that same cross. And what you have in a land race is lots of individuals that are all crossing. So you have a lot more diversity out there. And I believe that plenty was preserved to, uh, to keep it going. Yes? I'm intrigued by the use of the term race and land race. Yeah. Here. So these are terms that we have moved away from or are trying to move away from when it comes to home, classifying homo sapiens. Right. So what makes it, what well, is it about corn that makes it a more accurate term to use? <laughs> um, I would just say the only reason it's used is because there's not another term that's, that's defined out in the literature. So I guess I could probably try to come up with something that's more, well, that's less demeaning than race. Because it would definitely, it could be easily translated um, from the corn to the people growing the corn. I think that wouldn't be a, a hard jump for people to make. Um, and actually, I had never thought of that, which <laughs> boggles my mind that I hadn't put those things together. But yeah, it's just, it's the, the terminology that's in the literature, so. Jake, that's embedded in thought. I mean, the notion of racism. Yeah. And it's totally removed from anything that we've done with regard to uh, uh, the uh, bi so-called biological definition of race and all the sociological components of it. Right. Human beings. Yeah, the definitions are very are much more precise and I think the only thing that you could run into trouble with is when you're working with a land race that's associated with a per certain group of people. Uh, so I think that's that's the only reason you might want to Ex maybe explain it or something, but it's if if when I publish the paper, I'll I'll probably have to use that terminology. If I write a book for the tribe to, to disperse to tribal members, I'll probably find some other word. <laughs> yes, Tim. Jay, from your experience, how many people, how many Miami people are growing Miami on the Jiffy, and how many need to be growing it over what geographic distribution to avoid the one-year disaster from? a blight or a drought or, you know, some other sort of one-off genetic disaster that could happen? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, first of all, I think most of the families that have been growing Miami corn have been in Indiana area. And I've tried growing it personally in Oklahoma, and there have been some hard summers. And Oklahoma, so as as these, these races develop land races as it's dispersed north, the corn, one really interesting thing and the reason corn is such a huge agricultural product and has changed agriculture across the world is because it's very genetically flexible. And it, as it moved north, it became more and more adapted to northern environments. So when you take a corn that's from the Great Lakes area and try to grow it in Oklahoma, it will still grow if you give it enough water, um, but sometimes it won't get near as tall. Normally, Miami corn is 14 feet tall. I have not seen it that tall in Oklahoma ever. Um, so it's, it's, it's physiological, um, so probably the best places to grow it physiologically would be um, Great Lakes areas where it's 
a little cooler in the summer um, and more consistent rainfall. As far as um, it getting wiped out, I think the main thing for anybody who's planting my, uh, a corn that they're trying to preserve is you don't plant all of it in one year. So you just need to save some seed stock for years that may go bad. In the back. Yes, from a uh, ethnographic perspective and a dietary perspective, when we think of corn, we also think of beans and squash. And in particular beans because of the kind of synergistic relationship you have with releasing proteins in corn. So this is a question for both you and David who just walked in. Um, what are some of the other plants that you find uh, historically recorded? And um, is there any um, evidence for other species or subspecies, maybe that could be a better word, instead of races, um, for beans or squash or some other plants that the Miami use? So maybe David first. <laughs> There are definitely records of different um, other plants that were used agriculturally. Um, however, I'm not really familiar with their with the language and how they were grown, so I would have to refer to David. <laughs> well, the further back you go, the more you find that like, at least 300 years ago, there was a huge variety of different types of corn grown. But I think with colonization and everything, the variety of Corn is much more, it's been diversified much more, so there's a lot of different land races where in beans and squash there's varieties or subspecies which are must, much less different from each other, or much, much more different from each other genetically, but there's, there's less diversity out there. So. And from the perspective of the soils, you didn't need to grow beans and squash with corn uh, in, the great, in the old great black swamps. The soil was so rich that you didn't need the nitrogen fixation to <coughs> the beans, which was the main reason for planting beans with corn in, say, a Jericoy. And so you didn't really see that direct association between the, you just didn't need it. The soil was so rich, you could just throw a seed out and it would grow. All right. Thanks. I'm a couple minutes over time, so I have to go. <laughs> you can ask me questions later. Thanks.